We're going to be talking about the lack of men in our respective fields, which are the mental health field and speech language pathology. Welcome to the ADHD Guys Podcast with Mike McLeod of Grow Now ADHD and Ryan Wexelblatt of ADHD Dude. Learn about parenting kids with ADHD from two male licensed professionals who specialize in ADHD and executive functions. No fluffy parenting advice, only practical information that will help you help your child. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker and Mike is a licensed speech language pathologist and we happen to be two guys in a completely female dominated field. The reason we decided to do this episode today was because an article just came out by Richard Reeves. For those of you not familiar with him, Richard Reeves is the author of the book of Boys and Men. He is also the director of the newly formed American Institute for Boys and Men. Some of you may have seen him. He did uh, a lot of um, talk shows. His book got a lot of publicity. And he recently put out an article this past week about the lack of men in the mental health field. Now, obviously, we've known that there are not a lot of men in this field. There's approximately 20% of men in the mental health field. However, in specifically the child and adolescent mental health field and school psychology, that number goes down to 10%. And what the data shows is that it is going in the direction of less and less men. So things are not getting better, they're getting worse in terms of men being represented in the mental health field and particularly the child and adolescent mental health field. And for speech, well, I was surprised to find it was a lot worse than I even thought. So Mike, what did you find out when uh, you looked up how many men are in the speech language pathology field? So in terms of total numbers, right now where we're at is around 4.7% males and the rest are females. So this is a really great topic. I'm so excited we're talking about this because, you know, I've, I've been, a, you know, a speech and language pathologist now for quite some time. And I've been to our ASHA, our, you know, yearly ASHA conference, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association, our credentialing agency. And it's, it, it's no doubt a female dominated field. At the conference, they tend to, you know, close the men's bathroom and have a second women's bathroom kind of thing. Wait, and do they really, Mike? Oh, they, they absolutely do. So it, it, it's, it's very, very hard to find a men's bathroom at the ASHA conference. Very, very hard. And ASHA is doing everything they can to bring on more men. So they're, they're spending a lot of money in terms of marketing and research to bring more men into the field. And I really don't think that outreach is going very well. You know, right now we're at 4.7. And just like Ryan had mentioned, the vast majority of those men in that 4.7% are most likely working with adults. You know, speech and language pathologists also work with adults in nursing homes with things like aphasia and dementia and TBI and rehab care. So many of them are, and also swallowing disorders and things like that. So many speech and language pathologists who are men work with adults. And then to find a man that works with children is, is quite rare. And this is something that, you know, is, is really important to me because I remember being in my graduate program, my master's program, you know, already knee deep in student loans and spending a lot of time and money and energy towards this program. And I was, you know, a year or two from graduating. And a lot of my female professors told me, you need to work with adults because no one's going to want you to work with their kids. They're going to think it's weird that a man is going to work with kids. I remember my professors telling me that, and I always wanted to work with kids. Even since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to work with children, with youth. My mom was a teacher for 50 years. I always wanted to work with youth in some way. And then hearing that from my professors was devastating because I didn't want to work with adults. You know, you know, hospitals and nursing homes make me very uncomfortable. It's just who I am. You know, it's not something that, that you know, soothes well with my personality. And I, I, I still to this day remember my professors telling me, don't, you know, don't go into early intervention or schools or private practice for kids because parents are not going to want a male therapist. Mike, you know, as you were talking about this, I thought of two things. So number one, Richard Reeves, who wrote the article we're talking about, I've heard him explain that he has three sons and one of them went into early childhood ed. And he said his son has been rejected for jobs simply because he's male. And, and wow. you know, the people said, yeah, we, you know, we can't have a male like working in, you know, preschool or whatever it is. 
But so, the other so, thing, so 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 actually, yeah. you know, my experience, you know, since I've come into this field, it's actually been the opposite. It's actually been you know, a lot of moms because you know it's moms who tend who most often take the initiative to get their kids into some sort of therapy or coaching or counseling, and most often they want a male. So if anything, myself and the male members of my grown out team have been in high demand. So a, a lot of moms will reach out to me and say, you know, every therapist he's had in the past has been female and we've seen no progress. I would love for him to work with a man. So it's been the total opposite from what my professors previously told me. You know, Mike, that's so interesting because I have to tell you, I have found that those that population of moms who kind of think about this and, and want their, you know, want their sons to work with a male, I find them to be in the minority in the mental health field. I find most of them never even think about that. You know, if anything, I think a lot of them go with who they like as a person, you know, not necessarily okay. who, who, who their son would connect, you know, the most with. But what I was thinking I wanted to mention to you was, you know, earlier today, I was thinking about how many guys have I, have I known, you know, and obviously I just want to explain to, to everyone that I have a lot of history with being around the speech language pathology field, because basically every training that I've had pertaining to executive functioning, to social skills, this all comes from the speech language pathology field. It does not come from the mental health field. So many years ago, I was introduced to the speech language pathology field and have spent a lot of time, you know, around SLPs and know a lot of SLPs. And one of the things I was trying to think about was how many guys do I know who are SLPs and work with kids? And I, I was thinking about it. And in my whole history, I think, you know, besides you and the guys at your practice, I can think of two others I've ever met in the whatever it is now, you know, 12 years I've been around SLPs, three in 12 yeah. years. We are yeah. we are a rare breed. We are we are an endangered species, us us men in this <laughs> field. And you know, a lot of it is, you know, I, I've gone to different colleges and, you know, spoke to, you know, you know, girls and guys and students in graduate programs that are working to become speech pathologists. And, you know, many of them, you know, just Googled, you know, professions of the future, you know, best jobs for, you know, coming up. And they, you know, people think of speech pathology, they think of just playing with kids and playing games and those kinds of things, which it isn't. You know, it, it, it's a really serious field, a medically based field. And, you know, a lot of a lot of girls find found out about speech. I was, I was surprised by this by watching The Bachelor, because one of their one of the contestants, <laughs> one of the contestants was a speech pathologist. And that's what introduced them to speech. So they pursued it that way. But that was a very small group from Westchester University out here. But overall, you know, more men in this field in varying positions, especially working with youth, is something that's just not normalized out here. Right. You know, the other thing Mike, I just thought of was when you said the thing about the bathrooms at the ASHA conference being turned into women's bathrooms. You know, when I used to go to the uh, social thinking conferences, when I started going to them, you know, it would be a room of, you know, 300 people, you know, and there would be three guys, five guys. And I remember yeah. some of the hotels was like, yeah, I would have to walk forever to go to the bathroom because the, the men's rooms were changed into women's rooms, understandably so. So that, yeah, that I hadn't thought about that in years until you brought that up, you know? Absolutely. So, so let's talk about a little bit. Well, what does this mean for boys? Well, you know, I think number one for me, the first thing that I think of, and, you know, and I want to talk a little bit about your office and when I've had offices and, you know, I don't have an office right now, but going to get one again is, you know, when you go into most therapist offices, they are completely unwelcoming to boys. Most of them are designed, you know, by understandably an adult woman who has, you know, the aesthetic taste of an adult woman and, you know, other women find it, you know, appealing or they like, you know, the way the office is decorated. But I want you to think about the moms who are listening right now. What's it like for your son to go into an office where there's nothing in that office waiting room that says this speaks to me, right? There's nothing in there that says you are welcome here or I want you to feel comfortable here. You know, and, and I'm sure, Mike, it's no different than speech, you know, in speech the language offices. It is is in, you know, mental health offices. Probably the same exact thing. Right. Oh, absolutely. I, I remember that, you know, during my first year as an SLP, which, you know, quite honestly, was a really difficult year for me. And, you know, in, in many ways made me want to, you know, leave the field altogether. It was a really hard year. And I remember working in different clinics and different schools. You know, school speech rooms, let's be honest, are, are mostly, you know, just, uh, you know, abandoned rooms and closets. But, you know, in, in terms of in terms of, you know, speech clinics that I was working at during my first clinical fellowship year, 
it was a lot of, you know, really, really small desks and really small chairs and those cube cabinets and a lot of, you know, it was definitely designed in a very specific way where when some of the, my teenage students came in, you know, their initial reaction was discomfort. And I, I, I talk about this all the time when parents first reach out to me about learning about Grow Now services, the number one concern, bar none, every single time is how the heck are we going to get my son to agree to do this? So, so here we have a young boy with ADHD and executive functioning challenges, and it's a disorder of self-regulation and self-motivation towards non-preferred tasks. That's number one. And number two, it's a disorder of self-awareness, so they don't know they need the help. So they would much rather you know, be at home, be, you know, doing what they want to do, being around screens and having to go to this clinic. And when they first hear from their parents, hey, I signed you up for executive functioning coaching, they probably picture themselves sitting in a room in a really uncomfortable room, you know, with a with a woman or an older woman, you know, having to talk about their thoughts and their feelings or they associate it with more school and more worksheets and things they don't want to do. So when 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 the vast majority of boys first hear about executive functioning coaching, they don't want to do it. They think, what the heck is this? Mom, leave me alone. I don't need this. This is stupid. And then if they come to a clinic that's not you know environmentally welcome to them, that's starting off on the worst possible foot. So when we just recently opened our brand new clinic, a larger clinic, I really wanted to model it to make it look like the natural environment as much as possible. I wanted each individual room to look like someone's living room or someone's basement or a dorm room at college. I wanted it to look as natural as possible where boys can come in, you know, jump around, you know, be themselves, be normal. I got pictures of Kobe Bryant all over the place, a lower Marion legend like yourself. So <laughs> it, it, it got him on there and, you know, some really old school video games and uh, other cool art and things the like that. Basketball thing. Yeah, the, ba the basketball yeah. hoop and ping pong table. So, you know, making it look like a basement or a living room where boys hang out themselves without adults helps to transfer to the natural environment. I, Mike, I want to draw a parallel between what you're talking about and what it's like in therapist offices. When I talk about therapists, I'm talking about mental health. So yeah. aside from the fact that, you know, typically when, you know, kids go into a therapist office, by the way, if you go on any therapist website, they will most likely have pictures of their office. And I always think that's weird because like, why do you need to see pictures of like, you know, what the person's office looks like? But I can't tell you how many therapist websites I've been to, people who specialize in working with kids. And there is nothing in these pictures that would tell you that this is a person who works with kids, except maybe the stuff like you're talking about for like real little kids, you know? Correct. But I, I think the other thing, Mike, the parallel here is that in the mental health field, you know, besides, you know, the whole experience, and I'll tell you why I first heard talk about this because I want to give him credit, which is Dr. Michael Gorian, who is a psychologist and an author, has a lot of books about, you know, brain-based differences between boys and girls and so on. You know, one of the things he talks about is, you know, a boy goes into a therapist's office, so he goes into a waiting room that's completely, you know, unwelcoming to him, and then he goes and is supposed to sit across from somebody making eye contact and, you know, being asked to verbalize feeling words on demand. And that is completely unnatural to the way males communicate in general, let alone express feelings. So the whole process of therapy, you know, I always say has been completely over feminized. And I don't think that's a, you know, that's something that like women intentionally did. In fact, I think men actually did that. But yeah. this is why I always say to parents, you know, do not make your sons go to therapy. And, you know, aside from the Aside from the fact that therapy is not even an evidence-based recommended treatment for kids with ADHD, what I tell parents is this. Let's say your son needs therapy at some point when he's older. You don't want to give him, you know, a negative perception of therapy because you made him go when he was younger and he was asked to sit across from a nice lady who was asking him, how does that make you feel? You know, because right. if he really does need therapy when he's older, we don't want him to avoid it because he had this experience when he was a kid. You know, so that's why I always say, you know, if you think your kid could benefit from therapy with the understanding that it's not designed to address ADHD related challenges, ask them if they want to go. OK, now that's a little different than what we're talking about with, you know, executive coaching, which is what Mike does or which we, what we would call executive function therapy, really, I should say, because they're two different things. And, you know, you're being asked two different things in, in each one. But I just really want to emphasize that to parents that, you know, for in the mental health field, please do not force your kids to go to therapy, even if somebody said they need therapy. 
because again, we don't want to toxify his relationship to it. And, and I think Mike, you and I have both seen in plenty of Facebook parent groups, right? What is the answer to every single problem? Therapy. Therapy, no matter what it is, right? Your 100%. son needs therapy to go and talk about his feelings, right? Correct. You know, Correct. By, said by well-meaning mothers who don't really understand how boys operate, understandably. So so that's that's what we wanted to talk about with this. And I will also mention that, you know, when I've had offices, my thing has always been, I'm not designing an office for a parent. I'm designing it for kids because I want them to come in and feel welcome. And if the moms like it, great. And if they don't, then that's okay. I'm not designing it for them. You know, I'm designing it for, for their kids. So, so Mike, I think we have to segue into a, a topic that will definitely have its own episode, but I think it would be good if I kind of introduce this as coming as an outsider to the SLP field, you know? Yeah, so, let's do it. Yeah. So many years ago, when I got into the social skills field, as I mentioned, I used to go to conferences and they would be, you know, 300 women in, you know, in a room with three guys. And one of the things I started to realize the more I kind of got into the social skills field was that you know it was a obviously female dominated field comprised primarily of speech language pathologists who were teaching quote social skills to boys and what i learned was what they were teaching boys was number one it was overly formal etiquette and they were Correct. they were teaching them social communication skills that were completely unnatural to the way boys communicate with each other so how many times, Mike, have we heard boys say things like, who have been through a million social skills groups, say things like, you know, what are your hobbies, right? Or things like that. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and this kind of goes along with, you know, you and I have done a, have done a very good job talking about this, you know, this, this very catchy phrase now of neurodiversity affirming therapists and kind of not doing social skills that way quite possibly makes you and I the most neurodiversity affirming <laughs> therapists there are. You know, I this, think this, so. is re this is really what these neurodiv this no neurodiversity movement is talking about is this highly structured social skills groups that are so focused on external social skills like eye contact, topic maintenance, formal greetings, circles of communication, all these external things that neurodiverse individuals struggle with. And the whole thing is, there's structured social skills groups, you know, trying to make neurodiverse kids act like neurotypical kids. But really, it's nobody acts that way. Kids don't act that way at all. So, you know, right. you know, putting kids in these highly structured, you know, often female driven, adult driven social skills groups and not focusing on external social skills, instead focusing on the internal skills of perspective taking, situational awareness, reciprocity. That's quite possibly the most neurodiversity affirming thing in the world. Absolutely. I want to tell you two quick stories real quick. So first story was one of the boys who used to come to my school year programs. And I do want to talk about why I started, you know, my groups the way I do them, which you, you know, also do something very similar. But one of the boys who would come to my school year programs, and then he actually worked for me at camp when he was like in seventh grade, he went into school and said to another boy in his school, oh, those pants look good on you. Well, the other kid flipped out on him. Why did he flip out on him? Because as you and you and I know, he was breaking a hidden rule of male-male social communication, which is you don't compliment another boy in front of other guys, right? That would embarrass them. That is a big no-no. But where did he learn that? He had been going to social skills groups since he was like four. And at this point, he was like 13, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and we see this all the time in terms of, you know, greetings and entering social social communication. Oh, the greetings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, hi, how are you doing? What are you doing this weekend? And all of these very formal, cringy based, you know, greetings that are simply not natural. So at the end of the day, we have to remember why are we putting kids in a social skills group so that outside of the group, they're making more friends, they're interacting with more people, and they're improving socially in the natural environment. But so much of what we've done in this field and this highly structured adult-driven field of social skills is you might see a little bit of progress within those social skills groups, those structured groups, but there's no progress at all in the natural environment. You know, during lunch, during recess, after school, they're not talking, they're not making more friends, they're not talking to more people. So why are right. we doing these structured social skills groups to begin with? The whole point of putting them in a group is so they don't need the group anymore because they have friends on their own. But that's not happening in these adult-driven groups. 
Mike, I think we should explain probably, maybe we should have started with this, how social skills groups kind of came to be. Why don't you give yeah. a little history of that, right? And then how they, they went from what they were originally intended to be as social pragmatic language groups to this one size fits all, right? Anybody who has any kind of social executive function challenges, we're all going to throw together in one group. Talk a exactly. little bit about the progression of that. So in the speech or language pathology field, there's, you know, there's listed different areas of language. So most people think of speech therapists as people that are speech therapists working on articulation and stuttering and things like that. But that's the speech side of things. The language side of things is completely different. Language is not speech. Language is expressive language, how you express yourself, receptive language, how you receive language. And one of those areas of language is social pragmatic language. So you, depending on who's doing the evaluation for your child, you might get a social pragmatic language disorder, a social communication language disorder. You're going to get all depending on the background of the, of the evaluator. They're going to give you a different label of the diagnosis here, social executive functioning, social skills, whatever. So social pragmatic language is something that was pushed by, you know, you know, speech and language pathologists, that it was a language based issue. And this sort of created this structured social skills groups revolved around turn taking and topic maintenance and taking turns in games and things like that. And then in the school environment where there's less time, less resources, less adults, this turned into things like lunch bunches. Let's set them up in a lunch bunch. Let's 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 take this child who's struggling socially and give him as much time as possible around his typically developing peers as if he's just going to learn through osmosis. So uh, a lot of these groups, you know, sort of just evolved in terms of, oh, this kid has no friends, throw him in a social skills group. This kid doesn't really talk to anybody. He's more introverted, throw him in a social skills group. And it became sort of the go-to to these parents who are not in this field and the ed and the the educational advocates and the lawyers that don't have a background in special education, social skills, social skills, social skills, without taking into effect of understanding what's happening in these groups, who is running these groups, is it, you know, a, a female adult, you know, working with all young boys, and is there any aspect of internal social executive functioning happening? So overall, it's been a pretty big mess. And Mike, let's clarify that, you know, the way they started out as social pragmatic language groups, there was a need for that. And really it was addressing the needs of kids with, I would say, more pronounced autism. Is, would you say Correct. that's accurate? Right. Correct. And then Absolutely. it just became this one size fits all thing, right? For, for anybody, whether you have ADHD or autism, you know, without really evaluating what their learning needs were. And, and that's why I'm like, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I have a saying when I give presentations, I say the requirements to, to run a social skills group are that you have a pulse. And that's really true, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think most parents know that. And most parents don't even think to ask, you know, you know, what are your qualifications to do this? But that's all kind of irrelevant because here's what we know that for kids with ADHD and on this podcast, we talk about kids with ADHD, the research data shows that social skills groups are a waste of time. And if you want to see the research data on this, go to effectivechildtherapy.org, type in ADHD, and you will see it. It's level five, meaning they don't work. But there is also research, Mike, which I'll let you share. That's a little older, but I think is really interesting. So individuals with ADHD and social executive functioning challenges being put in a highly structured social skills group that is, you know, adult directed, often female adult directed, focusing on external social skills, tends to make ADHD behaviors worse. So this is what the, the what the research is showing us that individuals with ADHD with the working memory challenges, so which makes carryover to the natural environment way more difficult, self-regulation and behavioral challenges, and, you know, attentional issues and self-motivation, things like that, being put in these structured social skills groups tends to make them act out more. So it's giving the absolute opposite effect of what the adult intended. Right. So before we move on, I think we should talk about a little bit about how we do our groups and, you know, summer camp. So, you know, some years ago I started How to Hang Out, which was my school year group, because I was working with a lot of boys in middle school. That was my main age group. And I said, I want to do something different that is not, you know, the, the same social skills group that they've all been in for years. So I decided, you know, I'm really going to focus on teaching, you know, how to cultivate and sustain friendships with similar age boys and how to communicate in a way that is natural. And in some cases that meant actually teaching them that what they learned in social skills groups all those years was wrong, you know. 
And then that was kind of paired up with going out and doing something in the community. So whether, you know, we would go bowling or just like walk to get ice cream. So the idea was that we're doing a lesson and then, you know, kids go out and do something. And myself and whoever was running the group with me, which was typically a guy who was a special ed teacher, we would hang back as much as possible, right? Because we want the kids to be interacting with each other, not with us. And that was really kind of the foundation for everything I've done since then, you know, from, you know, I now call it guys group, but also, you know, trip camp. And that's really been the foundation. So, and, and it's consistent with the research data because the research data shows that office and clinic-based social skills groups are not effective. I, I will say real quick, and then I want you to talk about, you know, how you guys do things, that I, I do think that, you know, professionals working with kids in schools can be effective because as we know, kids with ADHD learn in the moment. But uh, to your point before, Mike, instead of, you know, doing lunch bunch, they need to be outside at recess. You know, they need to be 100%. helping them. If they want to help them with their social executive function skills, it needs to happen in the classroom, you know, at recess, not sitting in lunch bunch during recess, which is not a natural environment for kids to be in. 100%. And this is one of the many reasons why we always hear kids with ADHD can never miss recess. They can never miss the free time. They need that movement. They need those natural experiences. And, and a lot of what you described, you know, we at Grow Now, we follow this exact same model. So we do, of course, our model of, you know, summer camp, trip camp, and we do lots of social executive functioning groups. And a lot of it really revolves around the kids naturally hanging out. Because at the end of the day, that's not how you that's not only how you develop social skills. It's also how you develop ex executive functioning, period, by by kids hanging out, not through adult structured, adult directed play. Play is exercise for the brain. Play is executive functioning. External play is external play. Internal play is executive functioning. So the more we can get our kids naturally playing away from electronics, interacting with others, interpersonal relationships, varied experiences, and that's exactly what we do. So we'll, you know, go through some sort of lesson, you know, talk about perspective taking, cringy thoughts, clutch thoughts, situational awareness, social reciprocity, you know, different things to look out for, preparing them for who's going to be in the group. So we'll work with kids one on one and do a group lesson, let them hang out naturally while, while adults fade back. Because a lot of these kids with ADHD do quite well with adults and navigate towards the adults because they're much more flexible and understanding and, you know, less, you know, less chances of, a, of an adult roasting you or something like that. And then so the adults kind of fade back, do a lot of observations, and they're there to sort of, you know, help out when needed. Then at the end, we can do reviews for some of the kids and how they use their brain coach and their strategies and use their self-directed talk for, for, for different things. But it's all about, you know, giving them the skills so that when they leave the clinic, they're more apt to call a friend, text a friend, go to a friend's house, or do something naturally. The goal number one of all of our social executive functioning groups is so that those students no longer need that group because they're getting enough social exactly. experiences yeah. outside of our office. You know, Mike, when I started How to Hang Out, that's when my office was in Bryn Mawr. So for those of you listening, Bryn Mawr is a suburb of Philadelphia. That's where my office was. It's a little town that's walkable. And, you know, I was, I think, you know, I'm going to give myself credit here. I was the first person in the area, because you weren't open yet, that, yeah. you know, said, I'm, I'm going to do this just for boys. And I, you know, I didn't think I would get much of a response because number one, there were 7 billion social skills groups in the Philadelphia area, but I also didn't know how moms would respond to that. And I was shocked at the response I got because what I found was there was a lot of moms who were looking for this. They wanted something specifically for their sons and they didn't want them in the typical, you know, a group like we've just been talking about. So, you know, that's what I continue to do. And I'll tell you, you know, my biggest challenge actually with why I haven't gotten an office in Tucson yet was because there are no like Bryn Mars here, right? There's no little walkable towns in Tucson. So I just realized kind of this past week, I'm like, I have to get an office downtown because that's the only walkable place here. And you know, that's what I'm going to do. And hopefully people will come. So yeah. Yeah. But you know, and, I mean, I love yeah. seeing the pictures when you do your groups and seeing the kids like walking around media and everything. I mean, it's great because a lot of them don't have that experience regardless, you know? So not only are they having that experience with you guys, but they're learning and they're doing it with similar age peers who are like them because Neither you or I have these, you know, groups that are, you know, with kids who have very different needs that because that would be uncomfortable to them.
as we exactly know. yeah Poison. yeah 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 and, and and like you said so media is the town where my office the grown out office is located we're in a a, a a building there in media actually looking to get out of that building so if media real estate's listening you know, let us let us, out of our, <laughs> let us out of our lease please so but we're in we're right a short walk from downtown media state street where there's a really great you know arcade run by kids with special needs so it's a, there so is it's a, yeah oh yeah it's a place called game on state created by oh. one of our four created by a family we used to work with and they hire kids with special needs and it's and it's like an old school casino not casino i'm sorry arcade and then we have a trader joe's so we you know we'll come up with a plan at the office about like some sort of recipe we want to make we'll go to trader joe's buy it work like work on money management pizza place an old school video game place an ice cream place that just you know getting a starbucks getting these kids in the natural environment as much as possible is so important because we have to be honest and this is what i tell my staff all the time is you know what do does the day to day look like for these kids i talk about this all the time they wake up they go to school they come home they stay home and if they are going somewhere with their parents they're probably on their phone the entire time ignoring their surroundings so th the more we can get them to leave their phones back at the office, go into the natural environment, experience things, sense things, you know, and, and we teach them to stand back and read the room before you enter that Trader Joe's stand back and kind of observe it a little bit. Look how long the lines are. Look how crowded the environment is, you know, figure out where the fruits are, the vegetables, this and that. And we're giving them all these tools that they're going to use for the rest of their lives. You know, Mike, to that point, I think one of the things we should really emphasize is that, you know, what we're trying to do here is is help kids learn how to cultivate and sustain friendships with similar age boys. And one of the things that I know we're both concerned about is, you know, how many boys in particular are being allowed to just, you know, sit on video games all day. And, you know, that's that's all their free time and they're not interacting with with other boys, you know, in, in real life, you know, situations and how that's become normalized for a lot of parents. And, you know, I think a lot of parents genuinely believe, oh, boys don't hang out anymore. You know, they don't do things. They just all play Minecraft all day. And that's absolutely not true. You know, boys still get together. They still do things in person. And, and you know, if your son doesn't have that, he's missing out not on organically developing social and executive function skills, but he's missing out on developing genuine friendships. And, you know, Mike, as I'm talking about this, I think how many times have you and I had a post on social media about this and some mother pushes back? Right. It was like, it's like, well, my son has good friends that, you know, he met online and you, you know, online friends is never going to be a replacement for cultivating friendships in real life. OK. And it doesn't matter if it's boys, girls, whoever we're talking about boys today. But but please know parents, moms in particular, that, you know, your son's Minecraft friends, no matter if he's been playing with them for 10 years, that's not a replacement for real life in person friendships. 100%. So it doesn't matter if your if if your son has, you know, followers on YouTube or Twitch and all these friends on Minecraft, Fortnite, Roblox, you know, those online friends and those online conversations, I don't care if they have a headset on and they're talking the whole time. I don't care if they're using Discord and they're talking the whole time. Those those social dialogue, I I feel weird even calling it a social dialogue, but those those conversations and those relationships, those online virtual relationships in no way, shape or form are going to transfer over into college, are going to transfer over into the workplace so they can work in a team and work in a like a team based environment at work. It is not giving them real based skills. So this online gaming gets rid of nonverbal communication and body language and facial expressions and the communication and the language they're using when they're playing these games. They're only talking about the game. You know, pass me that gun, build that fort, do this, do that. And it's not real social dialogue. It's not anything that's going to transfer right. over to the natural environment and build competence and confidence within the social realm. And the other thing I want everybody to understand who's listening to this is that we have a male loneliness epidemic in this country right now. And there's been plenty of articles that have come out over the past year about this. Richard Reeves has written about it. So this is beyond just, you know, social skills quote. This is about, you know, having connections and, and about boys not being lonely. Because, you know, one of the things is, I don't know, and I'm Mike, I'm sure this has been your experience, you know, in working with for years with kids, with boys in particular on this social stuff. I've never had a boy really articulate to me that he felt lonely, but he said it in other ways. And that's the thing I think a lot of parents miss because boys don't, you know, verbally articulate emotions necessarily the way that females do. 
you know, one hundred percent. And 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 think about in the past five years the number of mostly boys now that are doing straight up school refusal, refusing to go to school, so they're just home every single day. Look at all the boys that have now been taken out of their school and are now being homeschooled for whatever reason. Vast majority are boys. And then, you know, the overall, you know, depression amongst boys, overall, you know, you know, self-confidence, those kinds of things, more behaviors at school, mostly by boys. And think of all the boys out there that just simply say, I hate school. Their morning routines are terrible because they absolutely despise school and they hate being there because they don't have the skills to be able to self-regulate through a long eight-hour, nine-hour school day, especially with all these peers around, they don't have the skills to interact with. So this is, you know, really a serious problem of this men's loneliness, boys' lonely, loneliness epidemic. This is something we have to take seriously. And if the answer is always going to be get your boy in therapy, get your boy in therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, talk therapy where he can talk about his feelings— that's not really the number one answer, especially when it's ADHD and executive function. Not the answer at all. Let's be clear. Correct. Correct. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mike, to finish up, I imagine that there's going to be, you know, a lot of moms in particular listening to this and they're going to say, you know, what you're saying makes sense. And what am I supposed to do? Because I can't find somebody in my area. You know, I, I can't find a male clinician to work with him on executive functioning or the social stuff or whatever. So what should parents do if they can't find anybody, which is going to be a high likelihood for most people? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the number one thing that I always tell parents to do that I really feel like should be the number one recommendation as soon as you get an ADHD diagnosis is to sign up for your local CHAD organization. So CHAD is Children and Adults with ADHD, and it's all based on county and area and zip code and things like that. Sign up for your local CHAD, and they do a lot of, you know, different unstructured groups and meetups for parents and for kids and things like that. But you know, the, the number one thing that you want to start doing as parents is, you know, you know, making it an expectation and not a choice for your child to do groups, activities, clubs, sports, and varied experiences outside of school. They're going to say no. There's going to be, be, be to be behaviors. They're not going to want to do it. But these are the exact experiences they need to gain these skills, which are crucial to life success and independence. So sign them up for, you know, robotics. These kids tend to do very good in individual sports like golf, tennis, rock climbing, those kinds of things. Wrestling. So wrestling, that kind of stuff. So sign them up for, you know, sports, activities, clubs. You want your child to be out of the house, outside of the walls of the house, where they're most likely to, most likely to be dysregulated, most likely trying to pull you into the argument vortex, most likely to be surrounded by screens. Get them around peers in the natural environment as much as possible. And Mike, you know, I have another saying that I have seen scouts, you know, youth groups at churches, synagogues. I've seen that do more for boys than any social skills group out there. Absolutely. 100 percent. It's all about those unstructured social experiences outside of the home, away from parents. Right. And the other thing, so everybody knows, you know, Mike's practice grow now, they can work with kids virtually and work with families virtually. I, you know, my, through my membership site, I work with parents virtually. I don't see kids virtually, you know, because of what I do, but just know that those are options, you know, for trip camp, we have families come from all over the country. We actually, this year, Mike, we're having three international kids come, nice. we're having a there you go. Kid come back from Scotland. We're having a kid from Ecuador and we're having a kid from Puerto Rico, which I guess isn't really international, but but Amazing. I think it just Amazing. speaks to the need for this, you know? Absolutely, yeah. And, and this past summer, we had families from the West Coast, from California and, yeah, and, and Oregon. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, they come, they get a hotel in media right, right down from the clinic, and they, they, you know, get a hotel room for the week. And obviously, it's a huge expense, but, you know, they see the benefit. And there's, there's just nothing like this available where they are to offer this type of experience that's going to transfer over to the natural environment. A lot of it's going to be, oh, it's going to be a camp where he does well at camp. But once he's outside of camp, he's right back to square one. So our program, our, you know, the program that we run is all about progress seen in the natural environment. Right. And I want to ex explain to everybody also that I have research comprehensively for different groups for boys around the country, because once a week, a parent reaches out to me and says, is there anything like your guys group, you know, where we live? And the answer is obviously always no. And what I can tell parents is, I mean, I have spent hours and hours searching for things. And really what I found is that the things more designed for boys are often, you know, more nonprofit organizations. They are often in neighborhoods of lower socio socioeconomic status, often run at schools, which is great. And I'm so glad those exist. 
But in terms of clinical services, you know, whether it's, you know, what we're doing to help with the social executive function piece or with what Mike is doing, you know, with the executive function therapy, it's highly unlikely that you're going to find something in your community just because as we started this episode, there's a profound lack of men in both of our fields and that is not getting better. So we wish we had better news, but that's, you know, it is what it is. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, it's important to note, you know, we're talking specifically about working with children, working with youth and the lack of men in this field. Obviously, in terms of the overall job market in this country, obviously, there's it's there, there's a lot of work to be done for women in general in terms of women getting paid less for the same job. You know, you and I are both big advocates for women's rights and, and you know, and, and equ equality in the workplace and all that kind of stuff. We're talking about our own small little niche where we are, you know, the ADHD guys and we're in, we're, we're working with kids and, you know, in many times we're surrounded by females and we're in such high demand because we, we are endangered species, like we said, right. and mo and a lot of moms out there are getting educated and they're learning about the benefits of having a male clinician work with their son. And to finish up, you know, one of the things we do want to be really clear about is there are plenty of women out there. Maybe I shouldn't say plenty. There are women out there who understand boys and who are effective working with boys. And my experience has been whether they're, you know, a teacher, a speech language pathologist, whoever, that they have really spent time wanting to learn this, you know. And unfortunately, I mean, what I have to say is that a lot of them, I find, you know, clinicians, whether it's speech, mental health, whatever, they don't see the need for this. They don't see the need to learn how to work, you know, specifically with boys because there's more of this kind of attitude, I think, just in general in both of our fields, Mike, that, you know, anybody can work with anybody, you know, and, and gender doesn't matter. And that just hasn't been our experience, obviously, from, you know, as we've described through this whole episode. So just know that there are women out there. And what I would say is if you want to look for somebody in your area, I would ask them, you know, how do you vary your approach to specifically working with boys? And, you know, also feel free to take a look at their office on their website. Does it look like it's one that would be welcoming to boys, you know, or does it look like it was designed for you, you know, as a, as a mom? So that's the other thing to take into consideration. Exactly. And, and the one thing we all sort of have to become a little bit more comfortable talking about are these pretty stark differences between boys and girls. You know, it's a pretty natural thing. And ADHD is a perfect example of that, with boys being more hyperactive and girls being more inattentive and internalizing a lot of things, why girls get, why they're not diagnosed correctly in, in many ways and often not diagnosed at all. And sometimes boys are overdiagnosed. So, you know, the way ADHD and executive functioning and self-regulation present themselves with boys and girls is a really, is something that we have to be okay to discuss. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So Mike, where can everybody find you? Yep. So my website is grownowadhd.com and on Instagram at grownowadhd. And you can find me at the ADHD Dude YouTube channel and the website adhddude.com. And we will talk to you soon. Bye everybody. Take care. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Mike's practice, Grow Now ADHD, please visit his website at grownowadhd.com. To learn about the services Ryan provides, please visit adhddude.com. You can find Mike on Instagram at grownowadhd, and you can find Ryan at the ADHD Dude YouTube channel. The ADHD Guys podcast and content posted by either Grow Now ADHD or ADHD Dude is presented solely for general informational and educational purposes. The use of information on this podcast is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, licensed mental health professional, or other qualified professional, diagnosis, or treatment. Listeners should not disregard or delay in obtaining professional advice for any medical or mental health condition they or their child may have and should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.